Do you want to maybe... I don't know how long it's been since you read the article, but do they give like a sort of definition of social democracy or do you want to sort of like, or even like they, what we're about to- They get into it kind of. Um, but basically, so this one is more from the 70s. So in like the the early 80s, I'm not sure, honestly. Um, I think it was the early 80s. But, you know, it's kind of the, the dawn of- of neoliberalism so like the the beginnings of the death of the like post-war consensus and all of that other bullshit um tony ben no, i don't think so ben. this is this is harold wilson who was the british prime minister of 1966 yeah. um so it's kind of just like talking about i don't know the failures of social demo democracy to adapt to the crisis of 50 years ago, <laughs> just as it has failed to adapt to the crisis today. Um, I think it kind of shows into, like it goes into a little bit of the like, I don't know, a lot of the failures are very familiar. A lot of the kind of like, oh yes, we can always just coast by on <laughs> a healthy welfare state type of thing. And like, I don't know, end of the day, you have to kind of come around to the fact that that's not coming back, and that also, like, in many ways, uh, I don't know, like, it kind of gets into a little bit of, like, the social democracy of the past. Uh, it talks about, like, the history of it going into, like, World War One and the split within social democracy between the Second International and then what would eventually become the like Leninist communist parties and everything like that of the third international. Um, and it gets kind of into like parliamentary socialism just as a general concept and like the notions of reform and revolution and other such things. Um, and it approaches them in an interesting way. And I liked it enough to recommend it for a reading. So yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to preempt anything, but like my, I mean, my immediate objections to social democracy is just that it's not uh, not socialist enough, <laughs> you know, uh, in part because it's like, yeah, OK, like Norway might be able to give itself a nice uh, social welfare system, but it does it because it's exploiting other countries, you know. I mean, because even though even though they are. Let's say they have a better social safety net than other countries. They uh, also still, you know, exploit labor in other countries to get cheaper goods and whatnot. So they they still participate in the exploitation of capitalism. So. Yeah, and I think an even more prominent example would be Sweden, where like the bulk of its post-war wealth came from the fact that it sold iron to the Nazis. <laughs> like, yes. I mean that's that's a past exploitation, but like some of the exploitation has been ongoing. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, no. And like and it has just kind of continued from there. From the like, oh yeah, yeah, we know that we know where our iron is going. Did you say but... Switzerland or Sweden? Sweden. Sweden. Okay. I just uh, I couldn't remember. Nazi goal. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh in this case it was Nazi Steve. <laughs> uh all right, we'll get into it. And so it's it's got two authors here, but we're gonna there's gonna be like a little preamble by Sean Sean Good Good Sure That's Good. Uh, these days, as austerity sweeps the advanced capitalist world and welfare states lie in tatters, it's easy to romanticize post World War II social democracy. The epoch of strong unions, regulated markets, and rising wages seem like a golden age compared to our current era of plutocratic capitalism yet the sepia tones or sepia 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 yet the sepia tones sepia. can distort sure. our vision the european social democratic parties were populated with leaders who had reconciled themselves to capitalism and the u.s dominated global order when business mobilized against the reform agenda they quickly scampered back to safe ground unable to call in a rank and file they'd long since sworn off their congenital unwillingness to pursue policies that would threaten business confidence 
ultimately prepared the ground for neoliberalism's rise. Yep. Ralph Milliman and Marcel Liebman were keen observers of these dynamics, writing in 1985, when the Reaganite and Thatcherite projects were still unfinished. The socialist scholars chronicled social democracy's history of deficiencies for a landmark edition of Socialist Register. Without denigrating the reforms social democratic parties had been able to win, or downplaying the challenges any left politics faces, the two made the case instead for a revolutionary reformism. Interesting. While portions of Beyond hmm. Social Democracy are unavoidably outdated, their essay reprinted in full below is a corrective to blinkered memories of social democracy and a sketch of the kind of socialist politics we need to know. Reagan, Reagan is a... I need to... I want to read more about Thatcher. The funny thing is, like, in our context, I always, like, read more about Reagan and all the shit that he did, and I'm sure... Like, I know for a fact that Thatcher did a ton of terrible stuff. I'm just less, uh... Sepia. Thank you. I'm less familiar just, with that Thatcher. I'm just so sad that that one IRA assassination attempt failed. Yeah. <laughs> or that weird, weird person that uh, wanted to kill Ronald Reagan, but for Jodie Foster failed. Yeah, uh, he has a YouTube channel now where he makes music. Are you, did you see he was let out? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he would yeah, yeah, yeah. Be in jail, all right. John Hinckley Jr., yeah, yeah. I just find that, that whole thing fascinating, because, like, you would you would think with Reagan that it would be some sort of, like, politically motivated assassination, and it was just some, some dude. Just some dude. All right, so this is the... In this essay, we seek to answer two closely related questions. First... Why socialists in advanced capitalist countries should want to move beyond social democracy? And secondly, what are the requirements and implications of such a move? Until not so long ago, the first of these questions would have seemed rather indecent. Of course, all serious socialists wanted to move beyond social democracy. Of course! Today, no such intention or desire can be taken for granted. It probably should have ever been, been taken for granted. For even where there is sharp criticism of the limitations of derelictions of social democracy, there is also an implicit acceptance of it. Based upon despairing uncertainty about what else is possible, so both questions do need to be probed. I want to say it's interesting, too, because this was written in the 80s, but, like, in our modern context, I think that, like, a ton of people think, like, it's, it's almost like they can't even perceive beyond social democracy. Like, social democracy has just become, like, the thing to achieve and nothing beyond it you know what i mean for well, yeah. a lot of no i mean not just for a lot of people but for a lot of like groups and parties and everything like that like you look at the demands of every communist group pretty much in every you know unanimous leaning group in canada at least in the us that i can think of they're all kind of their their goals at best are social democracy. Yeah. Like that is the thing that they are aiming towards. And it's like, wow, how far right everything has gone. And you know, that's not getting into like the incomplete rift between like Leninism and social democracy, where like even the USSR and socialist China and like et cetera, et cetera, all maintain kind of like social de democratic trends to them just in a one-party system, still, like, I don't know, the dream... Yeah, there, yeah, there is an inability to dream of a better world. Yeah. Uh, Nick says, Thatcher sold off a lot of the nationalized services because she believed in free markets and sold off a lot of the UK production without a safety net for miners and people working in a lot of sectors favoring privatization. This is why the North of England hates stories. Yeah, I... I want to learn more about the union stuff with Thatcher and the striking miners and all the shit that went down there. Uh, it's just a part of history. I'm not like I I know I know of it, but haven't like read any like histories or biographies uh, about it. as much as I have for like Reagan, who uh, essentially was the same type of figure, but in America. But I know, I know of the periphery of the shit that she did. 
watch the musical Billy Elliot. I, I have seen the musical. Actually, we watched Billy Elliot recently, and uh, Rachel didn't like it that much. <laughs> to, to be honest, I didn't love it that much either. Um, I think it, it's it's too... They had the opportunity to make that movie into a a more labor movie, and they they made it too... Uh, what, what's the, how do I put it? Like too much about like the individual can like overcome obstacles and pull themselves up by their bootstraps kind of like story where it's like it should have been way more about the the community uh standing together and, and fighting the system at the end. And like they ended the union part of that film where it's like basically what happens is the they just find out that the, the union leaders cave and they just leave it at that. They don't really go into any of the details. Kind of disappointing. Fair enough. I haven't seen them. <laughs> well, I just saw it recent. Well, I, recently, <laughs> like within the last few months. So that's like, anyway, it's it's worth watching. It was a decent movie, but I worked backstage on Stratford's production in 2019. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. And continuing on with this, an answer to the first of them: Why socialists should want to move beyond social democracy? requires a brief re recapitulation of its nature and record. An initial distinction needs to be made for this purpose between social democracy before 1914 and social democracy after World War I, and particularly since 1945. In its earlier formative phase, social democracy unambiguously stood for the wholesale transformation of the social order, from capitalism to socialism, on the basis of the social appropriation of the main means of production distribution and exchange, a far-reaching democratization of the political system, and a drastic leveling out of social inequality. This was to be achieved by way of a long series of economic, social, and political reforms to be brought about by way of a parliamentary majority reflecting a preponderance of electoral and popular support. There were many differences between socialists as to the precise nature of the reforms to be realized and the strategy to be employed in their advancement, and there were also revolutionary socialists in the ranks of social democracy, of whom Rosa Luxemburg was the most notable representative, who proposed a strategy of mass struggle far removed from the electoralism and parliamentarism of, predominant, of the predominant current. Still, reformists could still very plausibly argue that they too were just fully committed to the socialist project, as Jean Jouaret, 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 Jean Jouaret, maybe? once said about the French Jouaret. Socialist Party. Jean Jouaret? Precisely because it's a party of revolution, the Socialist Party is the most actively reformist. I need to know more about Jean Jaurès. <laughs> oh, yeah, um, uh... If I'm remembering correctly, he was the leader of the French Socialist Party, um, like one of the most prominent figures in the French Socialist Party before World War I. And I can't remember if he was assassinated or just like killed accidentally or separately um where like right in 1914 and then very soon after the party voted for the war when he had been a like very stout internationalist very stout with very strong like you know anti-war blah 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 and it gets into some of that i think in the next paragraph yeah. as well what gave reformism its pejorative connotations, which I just levied at it based on the previous sentence, and made it all but synonymous with class collaboration and betrayal was not its reliance on gradual reforms as a path to socialist transformation, but the support for the war by the leaders of the Second International in August 1914. Gross. And after and their fierce opposition to left internationalists, of whom Lenin was of course the most conspicuous figure. With the triumph of the Bolsheviks in Russia in October 1917, Lenin's strictures against the reformist traitors acquired a unique global authority and resonance. Yeah, the fact that any socialist party sided in World War One is uh, terrifying. I mean, it's not just any, it is the yeah. vast and overwhelming majority of them, right? Like, yeah. like, I don't think any party's majority sided against the war. I mean, even Bertrand Russell was against that war. <laughs> yeah. Like, Bertrand Russell... Um, but it's also... 
an interesting thing to note too about the second international was that only European or like white people parties were allowed, which is a whole other, yeah. you know, hmm, maybe the problem start- should have been more obvious sooner. Not great. <laughs> yeah. This has greatly affected the debate on the left on the question of what strategy is most likely to advance matters in socialist terms in advanced capitalist countries with capitalist democratic regimes. The debate has, in fact, often been conducted by the revolutionary left in rather simplistic terms. On the one hand, reformism equals socialist betrayal. On the other, revolution equals socialist rectitude. Okay? <laughs> I like that word. Rectitude. But the questions mm-hmm. that need to be raised in regard to the appropriate socialist strategy for these countries cannot be resolved. Either. I can agree with this. I mean, I get annoyed with, yeah. there are some people who refer to themselves as leftists that, like, get angry at any kind of reform, and, like, obviously as someone who has participated in Canadian electoral politics, <laughs> I don't mind some reforms in the meantime, you know? It's just, I don't think it's going to be sufficient. Yeah, I mean, the easiest kind of example to draw that I think has kind of been, like, dropped off in the last couple of years online especially is like the black panther party started as a way to get like traffic lights and stop signs at intersections in my memories remembering this part but not the city that they started in yeah. <laughs> but in that city to like basically you know not have as many pedestrian deaths like and it just kind of like escalated eventually into a both revolutionary and reformist group. Yeah. Sorry, my I had to pick up my cat. She was like, "Yeah, look at the camera smoke. Give everyone a show. Give everyone a show." Oh, okay. She's like camera shy or something. Every time I try to pick her up to show, she'll go, "No, I want to be on your shoulder." And then dig my nails and she just wants spot. you. Well, that's that's part of it. She used to when she was like really young, uh, and could jump higher than what she can now. Is she would, uh, when I would get home from school or work or whatever, would leap and then like hang out on my shoulders while like I cooked dinner and shit. <laughs> uh-huh. And so she still has like a, a desire to have. Chill and, and sit down. Yeah. Chill and sit down. Muta, that's a smart way of getting. Hey, Muta, you have a Twitch channel? You do Twitch, Muta? Should have let us know. How, how could it have been this long? Right? We didn't even know that you had a Twitch. Yeah. I just thought that you were being smart and making emotes on your own thing <laughs> so that you could always use it you stream minecraft hell yeah everyone should go but... watch muta stream minecraft I haven't streamed minecraft okay fair all right now with this cat out of the way oh let's continue more will be said about this later but the point that needs to be made here is that so far as social democracy after 1914 is concerned the reformist label has been of ever decreasing relevance to its actual purposes and is in fact quite misleading. For the purpose of social democracy, as expressed and practiced by labor movements and parties everywhere since World War I, has not been a reformist socialist project in the classical sense at all. From that time onward, and more and more definitely, it has in essence been a project of moderate reform within the framework of capitalism, a striving at best to achieve a better deal for organized labor and the lower income groups inside capitalist society. And this has been linked to the wish to see the state make a more effective contribution to the management of capitalism. Social democracy became Tax the rich is socialism. (laughs) Hell yeah. Well, can't put and move towards actual socialism. Social democracy became yeah. more and more atten- attuned to the requirements of capitalism. And where these requirements clashed with reform, it was reform that was more often than not 
sacrificed on the altar of the national interest, pragmatism, and realism, or whatever else might serve to cover up compromise and retreat. I, you know, here's the thing that annoys me too. I am uh, philosophically a, a pragmatist. And so, especially when it comes to like more philosophical concepts, I use the label of pragmatism to describe myself. And I would, I think, reflect on some of my politics as being pragmatic. It's just that I, I don't think that this word gets used correctly often. <laughs> and so it annoys me that it is like looked upon with like negativity, although I know the types of pragmatisms uh, they're talking about. Uh, it's the people who are like, uh, vote liberal because they're the only way to get things done. It's the most pragmatic to work within the system kind of bullshit. And that pragmatism is not actually pragmatism in the way I conceive of pragmatism. Oh, listen to Jody and his no true <laughs> pragmatism. <laughs> no, I'm not saying there's no true pragmatism. I'm just saying pragmatism there's just hasn't been tried yet. I'm saying my pragmatism yeah, is more of like, I like when things are empirically viable to a certain extent. And I would like to try the strategies that work rather than the ones that don't. <laughs> right? Death to empiricism. Well, I'm saying empirically relevant. You know, I, you, I mean, I assume that you're not going to like make changes to society based on absolutely no evidence. <laughs> You know. If there's evidence of it, it must be destroyed. <laughs> uh, all right. I'm convinced. <laughs> That's all it took. There we go. The reformist uh, transformative project uh, has remained a part of the occasional rhetoric of social democratic leaders to be brought out on suitable occasions, such as party conferences. But the rhetoric has been consistently belied by the actual practice of social democracy. The most it has ever striven to achieve is capitalism with a more human face. The record is consistent across time and countries, continents, from Attlee to Wilson and Callahan in Britain, from Leon Bloom to Guy Millet to Mitter the tons of people that I don't know in France, from Ebert to Brandt to Schmidt in Germany, etc. I don't think I know a single figure there. <laughs> uh, Atlee was... Oh, fuck. I think Atlee was the dude immediately after World War II uh, when Labour won its first election. Where, um, you know, everybody was just like celebrating on the streets the day after because it's like, yeah, a nominally workers' party has won election in Britain. And, you know, he's going to nationalize the mines and then we'll own it and whatever 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 and then like they did it and their miners like oh fuck this means nothing to us yeah now it's just the government having troops instead of private troops coming to shut us down like i guess i know wilson um, that's the american president i, I got that now no nope. oh atley wilson callahan in britain well i was thinking maybe um there's atley and wilson oh and callahan who's in britain i thought it was <laughs> Leon Blum was the Prime Minister of France um, during, like, the kind of lead-up to World War II. And Blum um, was also Prime Minister during the uh, Spanish Civil War and was, despite being the head of a, like, left socialist coalition, refused to um, intervene on the side of the Republic during the Spanish Civil War. And so basically, you know, let spain fall to fascism uh guy Mollet, i don't honestly fucking remember right now uh Mitterrand was a like <sighs> dickhead French. socialist <laughs> from yeah um and was like in support of france staying in algeria and like a bunch of other bullshit uh ebert was given two thumbs ups to movies <laughs> Got him. <laughs> I'm trying to remember. I think Ebert might have been the one that got Rosa killed. Um, unless that was Brant. Nom seems to know these people a little bit better than yeah, I Nom's, do. Nom's um, 
Naming all first names. Um, also, mute it. Verify what you meant in your comments. I'm trying to follow it, and I can't. You would be the villain in a Marvel movie because I choose consequentialism over deontology? Is that what you're saying? I can't read the sentence. <laughs> you that when it comes to consequentialism and deontology, you would be the villain in a Marvel movie. I have no clue what that means. Jody, your venom. I know what the individual words mean, but like putting them together in a sentence, I can't, I can't figure it out. It's an old Sam Cedar Tim Pool meme. Well, I know the Tim, because the Tim Pool meme is that Sam Cedar is a consequentialist, so therefore he'd kill all the people or something. I don't know. Like, had something to do with that. I mean, I know, I know the meme, because the meme was like Tim Pool said that because Sam Cedar is a consequentialist, he would be like Thanos in the, in the Marvel movie. And the idea was that, like, because you, like, you kill people for the greater good or something. I just couldn't follow your sentence. That's just the joke. <laughs> Got it. All right. <laughs> uh, that's the ide ideology of Thanos, who is a bad guy. That's, uh, isn't that interesting, Sam? Okay. Schmidt was the last SD chancellor before Angela Merkel and a total neoliberalist. I believe it. I believe it. Ah, uh, okay. All right. And here's the thing, it's like I know a lot about history, but naming all these like leaders of different countries throughout history, I would I would fail at that test. I would not do well. I mean, these guys were a lot more recent to nineteen eighty five Milliband anyways. Yeah. So I'm just saying, you want me to name philosophers, I can probably do a lot. <laughs> uh huh. Certainly it would be quite wrong. Don't what are you insulting by philosophy knowledge? <laughs> no, I, I believe you. Oh, it sounded like a very name every philosopher right now. Every <laughs> God damn it. a lot of people be. I don't know if even we have enough time to do it. Moving on. <laughs> Certainly, it would be quite wrong to ignore or undervalue the reforms with which social democracy has helped to achieve in capitalist societies over the years or the important role which it its presence and pressure have played in forcing issues and policies on the political agenda, which otherwise would have been ignored or differently handled. But acknowledging this and giving it its full weight should not obscure the deeply negative aspects of the record. And I think, you know, the funny thing is, I think this plays into why people feel icky about engaging in electoral politics, which I wish there's like a way to like understand the ickiness without realizing that there are minor benefits that are worth the like little time it takes to cast a vote, you know? And I honestly think that it falls back on a lot of people. There's like an essential quality to the act of voting that makes them feel dirty when it's like, because the process sucks, you know? <laughs> but I get yeah. It. For one thing, social democracy has consistently sought to limit the scope and substance of the reforms which it is itself proposed and implemented in an endeavor to pacify and accommodate capitalist forces and to demonstrate how much these forces could count on the moderation and reasonableness of their social democratic opponents. Whoa, this feels deeply re relevant to what's happening in America right now. And also because social this democratic feels... leaders in office have always readily endorsed conservative economic policies and submitted equally readily to the constraints that this has imposed upon them. Do you know what this makes me think of? It makes me think of Jugmeet Singh saying, dental care for all who make under 90000 yeah. a year. <laughs> to me, this is uh, Joe Manchin randomly being like, one trillion instead of three trillion. But it's the same shit. All the same shit. Or Bernie voting for the military budget, or like, yeah. you know, these other things as well. Like, it's all... Yep. The millennials have now killed off past foreign political leaders that who what will they kill? <laughs> what will they kill? <laughs> Avocado toast is next. We used to like it, but we're turning on it. Good. I think it's mostly that politicians hardly stick to their promises, so it makes it difficult for voters to trust. Uh 
Yeah, but I don't know. I think it's like you have to reach that enlightened state where it's like, it's not a like. Never trust any politicians' promises. They're they're gonna base their decisions on like voter like on popular wavering or their own like personal shit. So it's like, I don't know. It's not about trusting politicians. I think it's about leveraging them appropriately. I think it's more like the kind of what is it? The hesitancy to engage in electoralism is more that like because it is one of the few times where like government is kind of relevant or felt in people's lives directly beyond interactions with the police and uh, like bullshit, like going through the bullshit of government bureaucracy. It's like, it feels like you're submitting to those forces more than you are like, you know, actually going out and doing anything, especially yeah. when it results in zero change to your like everyday life, which is kind of what every election feels like all the time. It's like, oh, yep, I went and checked this box and whoa, the cops are still out here. Whoa, you know, people are still dying in poverty. It's just like, OK, sure, this this. I think you've hit, the you know, me recognizing people... and acknowledging it. Yeah, I think you've nailed, put like, you know, hit the nail on the head for people who are ostensibly on the left and why they would not engage in electoral. That is definitely. A... I, I and like, don't know if it's like broader than just that on the left, left though. though. Yeah. I don't know. I get the feeling, and this isn't to like denigrate people. I just like, I look at people like my parents and, and honestly think that there's people out there that just don't spend a lot of time thinking about this stuff, you know? No. And so it could go no, like, down to some of the stuff that Nick's saying too, which is just some some semblance of trust. Like, I get that feeling when I listen to uh, Jimmy Dore supporters as well, where it's like their grievance just seems to be a, an emotive state of anger with no direction, you know? But you were going to say something else. Sorry. Um, I guess more what I was thinking was like, a lot of it is kind of just like your regular everyday non-voter as well, where it's like, for the most part, they don't feel the government directly. Like, it, it is always through an indirect or kind of just constant force that government is felt. It's not through, like, you know, you elect your MP and then your MP is like, oh, wow, thank you, Jimmy from <laughs> 82 Richmond Street for voting for me. Uh, here is your benefits package for voting for me. Or, you know, whatever other bullshit. Like, it's not... For the most part, the government doesn't like actually touch everyday life. So if it's not relevant to you, then like why would you care enough to put in the effort to support it either? Yeah. Yep. Yep. I don't know, yeah. I don't know how to how do you fix that other than revolution? <laughs> exactly. As a result, social democratic reforms, however useful, have tended to uh, have a limited character and impact and have been very vulnerable to conservative attack. Very true. Even when circumstances were most favorable, for instance, in the years after World War II, in such countries as Britain and France, when popular readiness and support for radical change was very high, it was timidity rather than boldness, submission to convention rather than innovate, innovative zeal, which characterized social democratic reforming. Second, secondly, so, sorry, I'm, I've got like cat hairs all blown up in my face now from petting this beast who lays in front. I can of me. read a bit if you want a break to rub your nose okay, and whatever. No, we're on second. Okay, I'm gonna pull up the article on my phone. Just give me two seconds. Everyone gets. Just because that's a little bit. We need an Oprah giveaway when knocking on people's doors. You get benefits and you get tax relief. <laughs> Everyone gets more money. Um, okay. Everybody Secondly, social democracy... Sorry, go on. <laughs> uh -huh. Secondly, social democracy has generally been deeply concerned to narrow the scope of political activity. 
to confine it as far as possible to carefully controlled party and par parliamentary channels, to restrict and stifle gra grassroots activism except in the service of the party's electoral interests. Much of the energy of social democratic, le social democratic leaders has been devoted to the containment and channeling of the energies of their rank and file, and to the control of that rank, rank and file by the party apparatus. Much of the same concern has been evident among trade union leaders as well. That feels like the NDP also. Yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, control it. Well, I mean, that's internal to unions as well. Yeah. Um, thirdly and relatedly, social democratic leaders have always reserved their most energetic attacks for left, left activists in the labor movement. Social democratic hostility to the left was already fierce and pervasive long before the Bolshevik revolution and the coming into being of communist parties. The establishment of Soviet Russia and the Communist parties gave a new dynamic and legitimation to the struggle against anyone who demanded more radical policies and actions than social democratic leaders who were themselves prepared then social democratic leaders were themselves prepared to endorse and provided these leaders with a convenient bogey to use against their opponents on the left whatever their particular brand of socialism might be social democratic leaders in parties and trade unions thus turn themselves into very effective watchdogs against the spread of socialist ideas and influence in the labor movement. No conservative politician could hope to have anything like the same impact in this respect. The effect of these endeavors has been of immense importance in the history of labor, labor movements everywhere. I don't know how directly relevant that part is, considering the death of the Soviet Union and the Communist parties um, in North America especially, uh since the writing of this article um but like at the same time you can also kind of feel the after effects of it i mean there is a sense in which i do find that labor unions even here effectively safeguard against like more revolutionary thinking in a lot of ways i think Mm -hmm. but there's a sense in which I, I don't understand this last part which is no conservative politician could hope to have anything like the same impact in this respect and I feel like that shifted especially in the 80s which is right when they're writing so like, I don't know because conservatives yeah, found a way I mean... to like go around that with appealing to people's like like more to like culture and individualism and stuff like that and sort of like sidestep the, the union in a lot of ways. Yeah, I mean, and this would have been, you know, starting around the times where, uh, like with what O'Toole tried to do in this election, where it was like getting workers on the board of directors and stuff of companies and everything like that, where it's like, and you know, this is before unions died as well. So like unions were a much larger force and the same sense as like what you were mentioning like yeah they still do seemingly like passively repress the sort of like left flank and like more radical unionism but it it feels more like it's a sort of institutional memory of like oh no this is just how we do things yeah. rather than a like direct like are oh, you are sneaky communist party or sneaky trotsky is trying to infiltrate the union and make it radical yeah, yeah. type of thing i think there's like yeah another part that you missed though which is it's not just i mean part of it is that we've just always done it this way i think the other part is uh because of how how unions have gone away mostly and most of them that remain tend to be ones uh for job sectors like the public sector which pays a lot better and, and treats their workers a lot better that even within the labor movement you have a lot of like a kind of comfortableness that it doesn't lend itself to to the kind of agitation i think that's required most of the time at least that's what i've uh found a local a lot which is very frustrating yeah there's a lot of talk of who's a secret trot in the labor party i don't care what that is. like trotsky uh yeah, yeah, a Trotskyist. Because um, Trotskyist parties and groups were 
pretty famous for um, joining social democratic parties as a means of trying to like influence them from the left. Um, even Miliband, the writers of one of this article, was kind of one of those. Um, but in Canada, like it's pretty famously like Fight Back or like the Waffle Movement in the early NDP, uh, which has been covered pretty well by um, the Alberta Advantage podcast. Um, where like Trotskyist groupings actually like overtook parts of the um, NDP as a whole and like were then like subsequently purged. Um, and there was a bunch of different attempts by various Trotskyist groupings in the UK. <sighs> no. <laughs> and even Trotsky's parties didn't really, really like Trotsky by the time he died. So, I don't know. It's all a little bit confusing. Like, I did a research paper on Trotsky in Mexico when I was doing my undergrad and, like, um, read a bunch of, like, the reports from, like, after he died. And most of even the Trotsky's parties in the U.S. were like, yeah, I mean... We sided with him over Stalin, but, like, by the end there, he was kind of getting <laughs> on our nerves, too, like, um, <laughs> and, like, even the dude who killed him was a former Trotskyist, <laughs> like. Amazing. Leftist um, didn't fight yeah, him all yeah, the time, right? Yeah, yeah, but, <laughs> oh, yeah, gotta go. Uh, I wanted to say, two cars said, but apparently IATSE Canada is a non-striking union. I'm not sure what you mean by that, uh, two cars. I haven't read that. I know... They voted overwhelmingly with all the other like uh, American members as well to for the strike mandate, which is what I forgot at the, the top of the hour. One of the things I wanted to mention was that IATSE voted overwhelmingly for a strike mandate, which means that in case uh, if negotiations break down, they are legally allowed to be in a strike position. Within a couple of weeks or something, I can't remember how it works out in Canada. I think it has to be like, a couple weeks or some some shit before they're like legally officially allowed to, to strike if things break down at least i'm aware and it was overwhelming too uh as you can see by this uh make sure i'm not doxing here by this tweet it shows they had 89.6 percent of their members vote and 98 percent of the 90 percent voted uh, yeah for the strike which is overwhelming wow. support for the strike we had something close to that too. I think ninety percent of our membership voted ninety five percent for our strike mandate when that happened, which is a really good mandate. It puts a lot of pressure on the employer. Mm -hmm. So I hope I hope they get what they want. And again, this was retweeted by I IATSE Canada two cars. So I don't know. I don't know what's going on. Maybe you have some inside baseball. I'm I'm unaware of. But there it is. And for those who don't know, IATSE, they represent basically uh, like film crews on movie sets, like the production teams and stuff like this, it, including yeah. like television, film, but also commercials. So, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a big hit on any, any production team or uh, for any, anything, film, commercial, TV, doesn't matter. It, and uh, that's going to be... Uh, Quite a big hit on the whole industry if they decide to go on strike. So, I kind of wonder how much it might accelerate the kind of like CGIification of film and TV as well, because for the most part, CGI crews aren't unionized. So that work will be able to keep going, but pretty much nothing else will for however long the strike lasts. But are the other people... There's got to be other people in the production team, though, that would slow that effort down. I imagine yeah, yeah. Like audio people or something. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, it kind of depends. Like, but I mean more in the terms of like the actual CGI work won't be hindered by this, even if like the ability to get voice lines done or like anything like that. Um, I don't know. We'll says, see. We'll see. Something they heard the negotiation doesn't include union members in Canada. I'm not sure how it works. Uh, the thing, the only thing is, I know I have a friend who's been posting a lot about it who is unionized with IATSE. They do like 
you know when you see like a monster movie they help with like the makeup and production to make like monster like the prosthetics of on people to make them look like monsters and whatnot and uh from what i saw like in their posts they're they were voting and they were saying they were gonna vote and yet they're canadian so i don't know if it's because the the film crews are technically american companies or like i've i've no fucking clue how this all works especially with how international like production and stuff is so i don't know i don't know how that works but i'm assuming they they voted i mean nationwide so maybe it only applies to americans i don't know i don't know interesting they went on strike at the toronto cne a few years ago for almost a year yes yes let's move on i will continue this Fourthly, social democratic opposition to anything to the left of social democracy played a major role after 1945 in mobilizing labor movements. But do you, are those parts of labor movements under their control behind the global counter-revolutionary crusade which capitalist governments have been waging since World War II under the leadership of the United States? Again and again, it is the social democratic leaders of Western Europe labor movements who have proved the most faithful and dedicated supporters and allies of the United States in this global enterprise. With the excuse that what was at stake was the defense of the West, freedom, democracy, and the rest against the dire threat of Soviet expansionism and oppression. Yep. It would have been perfectly possible for social democratic leaders to oppose the installation after World War II of Soviet type regimes on countries contiguous to the Soviet Union without lending their authority to what was what has undoubtedly been one of the greatest myths of the second half of the 20th century. Namely, the myth of Soviet expansionism. Bum, bum, bum. The Red Scare. Social democratic leaders did not choose that option and thus made a major contribution to the granting of respectability to that myth. In the same context, these same leaders played a major part in supporting and defunding the defense policies of the United States, notwithstanding the fact that these policies had been dominated by American determination to maintain a preponderance in nuclear weaponry, at no point have social democratic leaders made a serious contribution to curbing of the arms race. Especially when a lot of the people who build those bombs are unionized themselves. Yes. Um, I mean, I think that's a pretty major failing currently in a lot of like the social democratic stuff too, is like for the most well, part an unwillingness to actually seriously talk. challenge yeah, the military industrial complex and et cetera, et cetera, like the arms trade and even just like basic foreign policy shit too, like. I mean, a part of that gets justified yeah. in like what they were talking about there, which is the fear of Soviet expansion, right? the Red Scare, this like idea that somehow somehow we're going to become like china is is the equivalent to today china they're taking over they're taking over everything apparently <laughs> jesus <laughs> the whole country is about china Finally, social democracy played a notable and utterly dishonorable role in the post-war decades in waging war or in supporting the waging of war against independence movements in the colonial territories uh, of their countries. I mean, this also, uh, you mentioned earlier about the uh, race discrepancies in labor unions as well. This will probably also exacerbate this. French social democracy was at the very center of the murder struggle waged against the independence movements in Indochina and Algeria with names like Robert Lacoste and Guy Mollet forever inscribed in annals of shame and British social democracy was similarly involved in the struggles of the 1940s and 50s in British colonial territories in Malaya and Kenya and Cyprus and Aden. Nowhere and at no time in those years did social democratic leaders anywhere in, in imperialist countries show any sign that they took the notion of socialist internationalism seriously. And you have to Fight like hell to get them to even care today. You have to fight like hell to get them to say the word Palestine. 
even without actually taking a solid stance on it. Yeah. <laughs> Did you? Can I, I gotta pull this up just because of how weird it is. Since you you mentioned the Palestine. Did you see the John Dean tweet that I shared? No. Or Howard Dean, not John. I don't even understand this. So Howard Dean responded to Eva Barlow, Eve Barlow, who's like this weird uh, Israel stand that just comes in here and just praises Israel all the time. And she tweeted, yeah, yeah. Israel is nowhere near an apartheid state, but I guess those who want desperately to believe that it is won't ask anyone who's actually been there. And Howard Dean, who who's an American politician who was running against John Kerry in the Democratic primaries back in like 2004 and lost because of a weird gap. Like he went, yeah. And because of that, everyone was embarrassed and didn't vote for him. <laughs> but he has his own problems. He's not a, I wouldn't, I mean, he was to the left of John Kerry, but like he's a Democratic politician, right? Uh, so anyways, he tweeted, I've been there. To Israel, and I think our alliance with Israel is important both to the U.S. and Israel. And Israel is in fact a, an apartheid state. And I was like, "Whoa, <laughs> okay, <laughs> huh? <laughs> what? I know. I don't even. Part of me wants to be like kudos, but then it's like, but you're still supporting it. I don't." I don't know what's going on in his brain. But hey, he at least acknowledges that it's an apartheid state. You know, like, could you imagine saying yeah, that... like, the same thing about like South Africa? Like, you know, I we're complete allies with South Africa and I I love them and we're gonna work together, but they are in fact an apartheid state. Just a uh, weird, weird time. I mean I know a lot of people. I think do. they could acknowledge that one. I no. I, I think I think they could acknowledge that one because, you know, South Africa. You know, was like, oh yes, we are an apartheid state. Like, yeah, of course. <laughs> the question then was, is apartheid bad? <laughs> yes. Well, like my what I'm getting at and here for is a long like, time, we... U.S. and Canada said. Right, but the point I'm getting at here but... is that like most people acknowledge that apartheid is bad now, right? So it's like. Yeah, you would you would think that if you're gonna say something like that, you would know you're doing something bad by being like, "Yeah, we support them. We support them in the apartheid." Like, I don't, I don't even know. I don't even know. Anyway, quick tangent. In short, the record. Do... <laughs> sorry, go on. Wait, no, 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 no. I should sorry. I do kind of wonder if they're just going to be like, "Yeah, Israel is an apartheid state." But, you know, we're also allies with Saudi, we're also allies with, you know, uh, Turkey, and uh, who fucking else are we allies with that's, like, really shitty? I can't think of people off the top of my head right now. Uh, we also yeah. backed up Pinochet, and like, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, yeah. So it's just like, no, like, sometimes we have to deal with unsavory figures. And I wonder if that's going to be, like, this shift that takes place. Yeah. Like is rather th about. rather than challenging the actual relationship, it's just kind of a like, yeah. Sometimes we have to do unfortunate things. It's just like you know, realpolitik or whatever the fuck. Like you just gotta be pragmatic, you know. Yeah, yeah. No, that makes sense. Yeah. The anti-communist support for our weird, and yeah, yeah. No. In short, the record shows quite conclusively that social democracy has never posed any real threat to the structure of domination and exploitation of capitalist societies. I had mentioned that at the beginning. Throughout, its leaders have clearly demonstrated that they have been concerned with the management of capitalism, not its uh, supersession, and in the field of defense and foreign affairs, they have always been much more the colleagues of conservative politicians than their opponents, which is why they always vote for the defense bill. In practice, there has existed a very high degree of consensus on the broad lines of policy based upon the acceptance of social democratic leaders of the policies of conservative governments. Occasional disagreements on specific issues, however sharp, have not fundamentally disturbed this consensus. The point is particularly applicable to defense and foreign policy, but it is hardly less relevant in other fields as well. 
I think the interesting thing is that we're entering a worse situation now where we don't just have conservative governments. We have way more overtly fascist governments, which makes the distinctions, I think, between centrists, the left, and the right a little bit more uh, potent or, or like prevalent, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Especially in America. I mean, like, we still have, like, the the interesting parts of our parliamentary system, making that a little bit like less uh, less of an available option, although we have the existence of the PPC being more prominent than it should be. Where the Republicans in America are just completely off the fucking deep end. There have always been many socialists in the ranks of social democratic parties who have opposed their leaders and sought to push them and their parties in more radical directions. They have on occasion had some successes and their efforts have no doubt also prevented their leaders from moving even further in the direction of compromise and retreat. That is correct. And uh, I've participated in, in doing the yelling myself. That's you, Jody. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's not like, you know. Not all I do, but I've I've spent some time. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just teasing. You're not wrong though. I I try my best. You know, I've yelled at I've, I've I've uh, antagonized a few NDP people within the party. You know. However, it must be noted that the socialist opposite opposition inside socialist democratic parties has never managed to capture these parties for the left. And given them a decisively different orientation and sense of pro programs and policies. This is true. This is very true. Social Democratic mm -hmm. leaders of the enter and right enter. <laughs> I'm assuming that's supposed to be center. Social Democratic leaders of the center and the right have remained in command of their parties and have continued to determine their policies and actions, notwithstanding the concessions they have occasionally had to make to their critics. Yeah, I do think that. This this part. Uh, no, that's that's. I thought they were making a point about the left. But it's the the yeah. right of no, it's just. Democracy. I don't know that part was. It also feels like very relevant because people keep joining the NDP and like keep like joining and be like, yeah, we're gonna shift to the left, and it's like, nope, they are gonna shift you to the right, like. Or you're just going to get burnt out and not do it anymore because, there ha yeah, like, there has been no successful capture. There has been no successful redirection to the left. The closest we've seen with, with it was Corbyn, where the party actively sabotaged yeah. his electoral ch chances rather than have him win. Like... I don't know. It's difficult because, like, I don't... I think you're that you're mostly right and i'm not i'm not obviously saying that it's worth the effort necessarily but there are movements in the states like if you look at today's democratic party compared to where it was 20 years ago it's definitely more to the left now than it used to be and there's small things where like as much as i'm not a huge fan of jug me to be honest I feel like a lot of the policies, some of the policies at least, are to the left of both Leighton and Mulcair. And a lot of that, I think, has less to do with jug meat and more to do with people yelling inside the party. And it's the same thing. I mean, like, without the Bernie movement, it, it probably wouldn't have moved as much to the left in America, but... There's also the aspect of sabotage, but I think the difference is, I, I wonder if part of it is because Corbyn like fully took over the Labour Party, and because uh, I wonder if what's happening is that there's a growing base that these leaders feel they need to at least acknowledge to a certain extent that's making the, the movements in Canada and America a little different. Although, like, I don't know. That, and that's not to say, like, obviously I don't think it's sufficient, because I also don't think... Part of it is I don't think the party could ever become, like, a revolutionary party. The other part of it is I think that a lot of these, like, more progressive to the left people 
they might be more left than the sort of like center right aspects of social democrats but are themselves not revolutionaries so even though they're pushing the party left they're not going to push it as far left as i want them. yeah i don't i also don't know if it's so much that as it is like all parties have kind of gotten a little bit more image savvy i guess like you know because you can kind of see with like the provincial ndps where they're able to run you know the bc ndp being the biggest example of like oh you know we're gonna run and we're gonna do a bunch of great things and blah 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 and it's like you watch the oil and gas subsidies go up you watch the like rests of land defenders go up you watch like them continue to do basically nothing on like the overwhelming health crises and everything like that and i think you know because you can even see it in the conservative party nowadays where tool spent most of the election being like yeah we're not the party of harper anymore we're not racist we're yeah. <laughs> not homophobic were right. you know Ooh, we evident. yeah so it's kind of like I wear converse on the kids like they just it. yeah like like they all still govern from the right they all still govern and enact power repressively and like in ways to like harm people they're just everybody's a little bit more conscious of like the way that they look and the possible backlash on the internet but that doesn't have to change how they actually do politics they're just more polite about it it's the you know kamala harris thing that happened a couple of days ago where she was talking to palestinian oh, yeah. a palestinian student group and was like i hear you your experience is valid blah 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 blah, blah. and it's like okay you're still gonna like I... give people money to slaughter palestinians like i do feel i don't i i like, I do agree with you, and I don't know if there's, like, some sort of, like, essential character to that, of just, like, working as being a part of the system, it naturally makes you, like, incapable of, like, doing the things that you say or whatever, or, like, like, I don't know, I don't know what it is, uh, other than, like, you know, like, Horgan himself, it just is going to capitulate because he cares more about business and certain metrics than he should you know uh but and like i feel like it, no offense to andrea horvath but i feel like andrea horvath is just as liable to go in a horgan direction <laughs> oh yeah i'm i even think like jug meat might as well but like there's something i don't know i feel like jug meat feel like I could yell at Jugmeat and, and get him to move more than Andrea. But I don't... I don't know. I don't know. But but then it also, it's like, I look at what's happening in America right now, and there are some pretty, like, decent progressives that are doing some stuff and actually leveraging their power appropriately right now, especially when it comes to this infrastructure bill. But, yeah. I mean, but they also don't have apps, like, they're not l the leader of, like, a majority caucus as well so i don't know but i mean like that's the thing is we also need a, a movement as well because i think it, these choices that horgan will make would be a lot harder for him to make if he had a sufficient like a, a threshold of people like actually putting pressure on him. i think what's going on in like uh, what is it fairy creek like these actions are hmm. good but like they're like one-offs in like certain areas and not really shutting down the entire province you know and it's like bring those, back the rail blockade yes yeah. and it's that kind of like mass strategy that we need i think to actually apply the pressure to get to a better point where we could actually push for even more you know bc liberals they were absolutely going to privatize car insurance yikes yeah, I mean, two cars. I'm not saying that yeah. they're the exact same parties. So what I'm we saying... Are saying is that we need uh, the Conservative Party in BC. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we need the BC Conservatives to win. That's that's the goal right there. <laughs> Probably for the right. Uh, 
like <laughs> um shall I continue or were you finishing yeah. a thought okay uh, also, two cards ha said though there's not a lot of options, either electoralism or violence, and it's like, yep, I agree, and electoralism isn't working. Yeah. Um. Anyways, continue. <laughs> God, the Socrates would do so well right now. Are you kidding me? If the social credit movement came back. I mean, I guess that's basically just Andrew Yang, but, like, that's also, like, the Greens UBI and, like, all of these other things, where it's, like, you know, they've taken social credit principles, basically, and be like, yeah, if we do give people money, then they will buy things, and that'll help the economy. And it's, like, they did this already. They did this. They were in power in Alberta for, like, 60 years. Like... <laughs> Social credit for everyone. I don't know much about the social credit part. Of it. Anyways, nor does there seem to be any very good reason for thinking that matters are likely to be very different in the future. It is, of course, possible, indeed likely, that socialists will continue to extract occasional concessions from their leaders in programmatic and even impractical terms. So it's basically what I was just talking about. And it's equally possible that the pressure of events will compel these leaders to adopt different policies, even somewhat more radical ones, that they will, for instance, be compelled to take a greater distance from American defense and foreign policies and seek to act as a more restraining influence on the United States than has been the case in the past. To a limited extent, some such shift in these areas has already occurred in the years of the Reagan presidency, only for it to backslide. <laughs> I mean, you can kind of see that now still, too, or like yeah. as recently as the invasion of Iraq, where they changed it from French fries to freedom fries because <laughs> the French refused to invade Iraq with them. <laughs> that's what you got from that section. <laughs> yep, that's what I got from that section. Uh, yeah. I say the distance. I mean, like, he's making it sound like there was a. a shift more towards the progressive and anti-war under Reagan yet like after the Reagan era you had Bill Clinton as the Democrat so definitely he's talk they're talking about European social democrats though I guess. American I guess social democrats is, don't exist right like I mean but they're talking about the United States I mean, they're talking about socialist leaders in their countries okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. and their relations to the United oh, States. Okay. I caught that. Yeah. I'm there. Yeah. yeah. Anything of this sort must, of course, be welcomed from a socialist point of view, but it should on no account obscure the fact that any such variation in program or action occurs within a social democratic framework, which is very set and solid. What socialists confront here, or ought to confront, is an ideological, political, even psychological construct of great strength, which is open, flexible, loose on its right, but which is very unwilling, even unable, to yield much on its left. In other words, social democratic leaders find it much easier to compromise and consort with their conservative adversaries on the right than with their socialist critics on the left. Yeah, I feel that. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth Warren? <laughs> Yes. God. <laughs> I still I I I I feel bad for Warren. <laughs> I don't love I Warren. Don't. I don't love her politics. I don't she's think she's perfect. But like I liked her academic stuff before she got involved in politics. And it's like she's she's not a good politician. She should have just hate, hate her academic stuff. Mostly because she got hired to her university as the well, first okay. woman of color. Yes. No, like, there's, there's that. I hate that yeah. so much. Did you? Yeah, I don't know that whole history, but like, there, there is something like. I, I can imagine the scenario. Like, could, could you imagine if, like, your parents told you that you were part indigenous and you just grew up thinking that and found out that it was like, it was all like. Of shit. Like, I don't know to what extent she participated in her own creation of that, like, 
perception or whatever. So it's like I can. Ma I, I mean, it's a very common thing, though. The whole like, oh, I'm one sixteenth, one sixty fourth Indian princess or whatever, like bullshit. Where it's like, you no, know, oh, Pocahontas was my great grandmother or whatever, and it's like. I don't know, it's a racist myth making. Like if you buy into it, that's your fault. Like <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I you there's something you that can be said about like buying into it for as long as she did, for sure. I just can imagine like even even out of the context of Elizabeth Warren, just like, you know, coming of age or like maybe you're in high school and you mention something like this and someone is like, Really? And then you look into it and be like Holy shit! <laughs> I've been living a lie! It's like, why? The fact that, like, I don't know, the, the history of white people doing shit is annoying. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Summarized it well. <laughs> in seeking... So I'm continuing. In seeking to explain the reasons for their opposition to the policies advocated by the left, social democratic leaders themselves have often advanced the view that whatever the merits of these policies might be, extreme caution must be exercised in proposing anything which the electorate could find extreme, extreme, <laughs> and therefore unacceptable. <laughs> On this view, the reluctance of social democratic leaders to endorse, let alone initiate, radical policies is not due to their own predilections, but to their realism and to their understanding of the fact that to move too far ahead of public opinion and advocate policies for which the public is not ready is to court electoral disaster and political paralysis. So this is the kind of pragmatism I hate. Uh, and for one, because I don't think it's pragmatic. What is this? Yeah. Why is that happening? I mean, part of, like, why, why it's not uh, pragmatic, well, like, for one, I think the pragmatism should be downstream of what, like, the good is. So it's, like, it shouldn't be, like, we need to be, like, we need to work with people now or, like, whatever. The point should be, like, what is the good? And then what are pragmatic ways of getting people there, right? So, like, maybe being extreme can get people there. Or maybe the extreme thing is still worth heading towards even though there may be pragmatic steps to get there. But this kind of pragmatism is to just, like, give up because people are obstinate or something, which is not the, the right take. Or, like, it's assuming that the actions themselves are, like, wrong. Like, anything extreme is just inherently, like, not workable or not good, which has been proven wrong over and over. I mean, and it's also taking "quote unquote" public opinion at face value. Um, and a lot where of it's like, do it, like, and it's like, then change them. Go out there and, and change people. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. That just part just frustrating. Yeah. No. No. Like, I don't know. I think it's less that than it is like. You know, you read an opinion poll or two and you're like, oh, yes, this is the people's opinion on this. When it's like, no, the people who answer a poll are not actually indicative of society as a whole. Like, they are still a very specific subset of people that isn't, you know, universalizable or whatever. Tukars is saying that they look more into the IATSE Canada thing and the BC local has agreements to not strike for anything in production, but members are free to observe picket lines without repercussion and that there's US-based crews in basically every major production, so there will be shut down. Interesting. Interesting. This raises some very large and important points. It is undoubtedly true that the electorate in the capitalist democratic regimes of advanced capitalist countries does not support parties which advocate or which appear to stand for the revolutionary overthrow of the political system. I mean, part of the problem is you wouldn't know that even if they did because America did its best or most places did their best to get rid of uh, those parties. And the electorate here includes the overwhelming mass of the working class as well as other classes. These rejection 
This projection by the working class and lower income groups in general of parties committed or seemingly committed to the overthrow of the political and social order is a fact of major political importance, to say the least. However, this does not at all mean that organized labor, the working class, and the subordinate population of advanced capitalist countries, which constitutes the vast majority of the population, is also opposed to far-reaching changes and radical reforms. Social democratic parties have themselves been driven on many occasions to proclaim their transformative ambitions in their electoral manifestos and to speak to their firm determination to create a new social order, and have nevertheless scored remarkable electoral victories with such programs. Popular commitment to radical transformative purposes may not, generally speaking, be very deep, but there has at any rate been very little evidence of popular revulsion from such purposes. Which is why uh, whenever Jugmeet says tax the rich, he gets uh, roaring applause. Yeah, or when people like tack oil companies or, you know, concepts like the Green New Deal or Medicare for all. like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like all of those things are very, they are, you know, quote unquote, radical reforms Yeah, that are popular. The notion that very large parts of the electorate and notably the working class were found to reject radical programs is a convenient alibi, but little else. The real point, which is crucial, is that such programs and policies need to be defended and propagated with the utmost determination and vigor by leaders totally convinced of the justice of the cause. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It is this which is always lacking. Infirmity of purpose and the fear of radical measures lies not with the working class, but with the social democratic leaders. Which is one way, like, I think there's some reason why Bernie, I think, is a lot better at this than some of the Clinton. But there's, like, a zeal. I mean, like, I, I didn't mean to use zeal when I forgot that that was the whole jug mead. Unlimited. Unlimited. But uh, there is a kind of, like, confidence, I guess I would say, that Bernie has in advocating for these things that jug mead doesn't necessarily have. Uh, in part because I don't think Jugmeat is as to the left as Bernie. Hmm. The same point must be made about social democratic democratic governments. Such governments have never been disavowed by the working class because they were too extreme or radical or overzealous in pressing forward with reform. On the contrary, they have been disavowed precisely because they have regularly retreated from the promises enshrined in their manifestos. Yeah. Because they have adopted policies that ran counter to these promises, because they disillusioned and demoralized their supporters. This all is all sounding like uh, yeah. DC NDP. <laughs> it just they... sound like their regular NDP. Yeah. <laughs> well, granted, the NDP has never had a lot of power in the federal aspect. Yeah. And because they gave every indication yeah. that there was little to expect from their continuance in office. It is in this connection very odd that the lamentations which are so often heard on the left about the decline of working class support for social democratic parties do not take greater account of the record of social democratic governments. The wonder is not the decline, but the resilience of support which, despite everything, endures for such parties in the working class and beyond. It is also import an important part of the picture that social democratic retreats and derelictions have disastrous repercussions on the labor movement. As social democratic governments retreat, so division and strife inside social democratic parties grow. The left protests and attacks the leadership and seeks to deflect it from its courses. And the leadership turns on the left and accuses it of disloyalty. Man, this is... Mm -hmm. They've got this. <laughs> yeah, no, they, they really got it. <laughs> Conservative forces rejoice and the working class or large part of it remains alienated or is further alienated from a divided and warring party. Yeah, my God. Mm -hmm. We are therefore driven back to the leadership of social democratic parties. Again and again, social democratic governments have been elected to substantial, sometimes sweeping parliamentary and popular majorities on programs of extensive reform and renewal in a climate of genuine enthusiasm and support and have very soon flagged and dissipated that enthusiasm and support and retreated into the positions and policies just described. Yep. It, it is, of course, true <laughs> that even very moderate and compromising social democratic governments 
confront very serious economic and financial constraints. Uh, that is true. I that that's the one part that makes me feel bad about the uh, Ontario NDP when they were in government. Mm. That's I mean that that's not the only like they can't just rely on that excuse, but they were screwed over uh, by the conservatives that preceded. Or was it the, the liberals? Who was the liberal? I can't even remember. But it was whoever it was. Maybe it was, it was the conservatives. Because they, they basically yeah. lied about... So was it Harris? No, Harris came after. Oh, okay. That's why I, I went back to the liberals. But I'm pretty sure it was the conservatives. And then what happened was they basically claimed that like the amount of money that the Ontario government had, they like over... I guess, like, overstated how much money was in the coffers so that when uh, Bob Ray was elected, all the plans that they had put in place that they wanted to do, they couldn't do because there was no money in the... Which, I mean, like... Which then gets into the further criticisms, which is there probably was stuff that they could have done that they didn't. It was a liberal. It was David Peterson. David Peterson. But that's why you get like the things like the Ray Days because they had to m- make up government money and shit like that. So, anyways, history lesson for another time. <laughs> Somebody outside just went woo. That such governments operate in a generally unsympathetic or frankly hostile administrative context in which other parts of the state tend to view social democratic ministries are ministers as interlopers, that they are subject to constant and often virulent attacks from an overwhelmingly conservative press? Oh, hell yeah. And that all conservative forces want to see the experiment brought to an end as soon as possible and do what they can to hasten the day. Yep. I mean, this section, there's not a lot to, like, say other than, like, yep. (laughs) Yep. All this must indeed be taken into account. It is perfectly reasonable, indeed essential, to appreciate the determination of this opposition even to social democracy. The point, however, is that most social democratic politicians are very ill-adapted to the politics of confrontation and struggle, at least with their conservative opponents. It is otherwise with their own activists on the left. I don't know. It's interesting here, and I know this is like, supposed to be from like the european uh perspective but there's an aspect here in which like there's elements in which i think bernie was better at this in ways not perfect but but better he was where because like where bernie was better was in the like not feeling the need to like how do I put this? Like, you could see a lot of, like, worrying and, like, hedging and stuff that other politicians do that Bernie was just like, I don't care. This is not a matter of character. Yeah. I'm just saying, like, in terms of style, I think Bernie was a little better. Yeah, I just, I wonder if that may would have even continued into power, though. You know? you know, we'll never get to uh, find out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is not a matter of character, but of ideological disposition. Those who get to leadership positions in social democratic parties are generally safe people who can be relied on to pursue moderate, reasonable, sensible courses. A process of co-optation, sifting, and selection is at work on the way up, so that people who are deemed to be ideologically and politically unsound can be kept at arm's length and pushed back to the periphery of the party. The apparatus itself is... Nikki Ashton. Yeah. (laughs) Like, that is literally Nikki Ashton, right? Like, she ran for leadership. She was guaranteed to not win and then has been pushed to the edge of the party on the verge of, like, probably being kicked out at some point if she actually does anything cool again. Like... I don't know if it's doing something cool. I mean, she just has to not do things uh, that are, like, obviously going to jeopardize her. Like, this is no offense to her, and I get her reasoning to do it. But the leaving the country the way that she did, 
gave them an opening to attack me, you know? Even though, like, I realized it was like leaving the country to go visit a dying one. <laughs> and she made the, and this was like during the pandemic, obviously. And so she made the choice to do it yeah, yeah. and like all that fun stuff. And so uh, it left her open to that attack. So like I don't I don't yeah. know that like she would be open to like an attack like that if she was just like I don't know give everyone money <laughs> I think they probably would have found a way to do it regardless like she would have said something good on Palestine or when she did the progressive international stuff with Jeremy Corbyn like I don't, I don't like they would have found another way of doing it I, I think they're they would be looking, but like it just I think that in some ways they got lucky, which is this is one that they could leverage without much pushback. If that makes sense, and yeah, just yeah. to knock her off like a committee, like a, or what is it like shadow cabinet or like I can't remember. Uh, shadow cabinet, yeah. yeah. The apparatus itself is under the control of moderate men and women and is used quite ruthlessly to ensure that the right people are brought in and the wrong people kept out. Oh, yeah. Where left socialists do nevertheless break through and cannot easily or safely be prevented from obtaining ministerial office, they are at least kept out of strategic offices such as finance, home affairs, foreign affairs, and defense. Yeah, I think that's that's mostly true. I mean, there there is definitely this apparatus, especially with the, the party insiders that prevent people from moving up. But, like, this is the one thing that... I, I'd push back on, which is that, like, this feeling that it can never be done. And, like, I do like that they acknowledge that it can be done. Although, like, I do agree, even when it does get done, how, how effective is that in the long run? Not like anyone in the NDP, at least, has succeeded in, like, taking over the entire apparatus. Yeah. For most social democratic politicians, capitalist society, insofar as the existence of capitalism is acknowledged at all, is not a battlefield on which opposed classes are engaged in a permanent conflict, now more acute, now less, and in which they are firmly on one side, but a community, no doubt quarrelsome, but a community nonetheless, in which various groups, be they employers, workers, public employees, etc., make selfish and damaging demands, which it, which it is the task of government to resist for the good of all. And it is a community in which help must naturally be extended to the weakest members. On this view, what is required of government and what a social democratic government is peculiarly well able to provide is goodwill, understanding, fairness, compassion, so that specific problems may be tackled and resolved. And it also follows that social democratic leaders, in practice as a distinct from rhetoric, or even sentiment, are by no means separated from their conservative opponents by an unabridgeable goal. No, because that's why we have the progressive conservative. Or compassionate uh -huh. conservative. On the contrary, there are many channels of communication, understanding, and even agreement between them. The business of social democratic leaders is conciliation and compromise. Their concern may be to advance reform, but also to contain the pressure for it. Gramsci spoke of intellectuals as managers of consent. The formulation is even more applicable to social democratic politicians. As such, they play a major role in the stabilization of the politics of capitalist democratic society. Debate bros. This is a, this is a debate bros fat <laughs> segment. God. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go pee real quick, but you can keep reading. Given this, it is easy to understand why social democratic politicians, with the partial exception of Salvador Allende in Chile, have never sought to probe the limits of reformism, and have always retreated long before they faced a serious confrontation with conservative forces. To have done so would have required them to assume the leadership of a mass movement from which their whole view of the world led them to recoil. It is simply not realistic to expect such people to provide the inspiration and the leadership required to bring about a transformation of capitalist society in socialist directions. The task demands, at the very least, a set of ideological commitments which they do not meet. Correct. Which is why, again, like I, I promote the idea of harm reduction, but anyone thinks that you can somehow reform your way into socialism through electoral 
I don't think you can do it. What then, in socialist terms, is there beyond social democracy? There have over the years been a good many different answers to this question. One of the main ones, of Leninist inspiration, proposes the building and nurturing of a vanguard party, tightly organized on democratic centralist lines, involved in a daily class struggle at the point of production and at all other points of tension in capitalist society, with the expectation that capitalist crisis must ultimately reach a point at which it will become unmanageable, as a result of which it will no longer be possible to contain popular anger within the confines of the political system. At that point, a revolutionary situation will have come to exist, which will make it possible for the vanguard party to seize the moment and lead the working class towards a seizure of power. The bourgeois state will be smashed and replaced by a dictatorship of the proletariat, on the basis of proletarian power, workers' councils, and other authentically democratic reforms. Or forms, sorry. Those who propose this strategy are well aware that in no advanced capitalist country has this scenario come anywhere near to being realized. Which is always my take is, well, not that I necessarily agree with the all aspects of the Leninist scenario, I, I do uh, realize that even any kind of revolutionary type of system or revolutionary energy is appropriately directed against it. But they are, of course, able to argue that the realization of the scenario is only a matter of time, that the crisis is not yet far enough, advanced, but, uh, but it is developing, that the working class is still in the grip of social democratic reformist illusions, that it is bound to acquire a greater class consciousness under the impact of events and so forth. I'm surprised they just didn't drop some false consciousness. Some such beliefs have for many years, in fact since 1917, sustained a core of dedicated militants and revolutionaries in all advanced capitalist countries, and indeed in all other countries as well. However, it needs to be said that this revolutionary scenario even with a marked aggravation of capitalist crisis, is very unlikely to be realized in advanced capitalist countries if or when a revolutionary situation does arise in one or other such country, the chances are that it will play itself out very differently from what it's envisioned in this scenario. Or uh, often get gunned down by the other social democratic countries. I mean... This is speaking post World War Two, so none of it didn't get that far at any point. But like, yeah, but like they were. Know, you can down look at it even before. It close. I don't know. Like, there haven't really been any revolu. Like the closest thing is really like 1968, and like especially May 6, 8 in France, where it was like the president fled the country thinking that the revolution was happening. Um, and it's like, you know, yeah, it just kind of heated itself out. Nobody came and was like, ah, oh, yep, time to take power. And the Communist Party's in France, or the Communist Party in France, voted alongside the Social Democrats to end the strikes that were at, like, the heart of the... May 6, 8, like, workers' movement, at least. Um, yeah, no, it's, it, you know, for the most part, no, the vanguard will just be like, um, I think we're done with this, actually. I think this is a little bit much. After the vanguard! <laughs> what happened in the dictatorship of the proletariat? This, however, is speculation of a fairly futile kind. For a very long time to come, what socialists will confront is crisis and conflict, but quite emphatically not a revolutionary situation. And all experience very strongly suggests that parties and groupings which base their intervention in political life on the lines just indicated condemn themselves to marginality and ineffectiveness. Almost like the Communist <coughs> Party of Canada. <laughs> Although we both... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh my god. Their problem is not that they are unable to attract any serious measure of 
popular support. The real problem is that they have generally I mean, proved unable to attract any serious measure of activist attention. What was the I mean to? I mean, they also are unable to attract any serious measure of popular support as yeah. well. You know, like it, the problem is both. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There are a number of reasons for this. One of them is that the notion of a tightly organized democratic centralist organization has proved to be a very good recipe for top down and manipulative leadership or undemocratic centralism and the stifling of genuine debate, almost like every other political party. For, for, uh, sharp divisions and resort to expulsions and a turnover of members so high as to make the organization a transit. There's the sirens have been going off all night again. Yeah. Jeez. Did something happen at Western again? I hope not. Yeah. Uh, sharp divisions of resort to explosions and a turnover of members of Ohio to make the organization the transit camp from innocence and enthusiasm to disillusionment and bitterness. I love that, because that is such a description of the Communist Party of Canada as well. <laughs> yeah. Love. Like when, when I see people first get involved with the, the Communist Party of Canada, they're so hopeful. Uh, they're the most active, engaged people in the political community. And uh, now I know a lot of them to be disillusioned. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm right here, you know? Yeah. I'm just saying, you're not the only one. <laughs> I know several. And you probably know several yeah, yeah. as well. Oh, yeah. Only the leadership remains permanently entrenched, presiding year after year over a constantly renewed membership, and virtually, virtually irremovable save by internal upheavals, splits, and excommunication. Yep. Yep. Parties and groupings such as this have shown very little capacity to think through the problems which the socialist project presents, and have tended instead to resort to incantation and sloganeering as a substitute. They have often included some very talented individuals who have made important contributions to socialist thinking. But the groupings themselves have generated remarkably little that was fresh and innovative. The ardor and dedication of their members have more often than not been doomed to ineffectiveness because of the shortcomings of the organizations of which they were members and the distrust which these shortcomings engendered among socialist activists in the labor movement whom they needed to attract. Secondly, the very notion uh -huh. of a... <laughs> Secondly, the very notion of a vanguard party has acquired an arrogant and imperialistic ring, quite unacceptable in labor movements with a long history and with many different and contradictory or at least disparate tendencies. Vanguard parties are by definition unique and dominant. There cannot be two or more such parties, but it is only by compulsion and coercion that one party can impose itself as the vanguard or leading party. In the circumstances of advanced capitalist societies with a high density of different organizations, interests, purpose, purposes, tendencies, and aspirations, a socialist party can only expect to be one element in a camaraderie alliance between different formations. It may hope, by virtue of its conduct, clear sightedness and support to become a major reference point in that alliance, even a senior partner in it, but without any pretension to an arbitrary and stifling, stifling predominance. I mean, part of it is like, or they just never even get close to being successful such that it, <laughs> you know, they'll never even reach uh, the scale at all. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This is not only a matter of yeah. strategy and struggle. It raises larger issues concerning the political system appropriate to a socialist society. All the available evidence suggests that the concept of the leading party, in effect the monopolistic party, tends to produce authoritarianism and the suppression of dissent. Indeed, the construal of all dissent as counter-revolutionary and therefore unacceptable. <laughs> the gulags! <Yep. laughs> I got my Solzhenitsyn sitting, sitting on the desk. <laughs> Again, Ugh. not a good source. I just, uh, it had the word gulag on it, and it felt right to, to race at that moment. That I think is what they're trying to refer yeah. to, right? <laughs> uh, I think I also heard the sound of some drinks, maybe? On my end? Is it? Oh, I had to move yeah. the drinks to, to get the book. 
Um, what are the drinks? Shall also, we talk about this those is, briefly? This is Diet Pepsi, but my next drink, because I don't have any Diet Pepsi left, is going to be Diet A and W. Diet A and W. I know. I... This feels it feels weird. It does. This does not feel right. But uh, it's all that I have. Disgusting. <laughs> This stream is brought to you by A and W when it's all that you have. (laughs) 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 Okay, now that we've had our (laughs) we've had our little ad break. For Diet A and W. (laughs) (laughs) Not regular A and W, and most importantly, not A and W, the fast food place. Just Diet A and W root beer. (laughs) There are no. (laughs) She's gotta go right into it. Do you want me to read? I just brewed green tea like a good Asian boy. Uh, sweet, Dom. I'm not a huge green tea fan. Solidarity, sure Dom. Your green tea is delicious. Jody, die. Yeah. <laughs> and go for it, Vienna. Um, We're on. There are no doubt I mean, circumstances of extreme peril. There are no doubt circumstances of extreme peril where diversity, pluralism, and conflicting tendencies are very difficult to maintain. But failure to maintain them should be seen for what it is, namely a major retreat from socialist principles. What happened to the Bolshevik party after the banning of factions at the 10th Party Congress in 1921 offers an instructive lesson of what such banning entails for the life of a revolutionary party. A further reason for the marginalization and relative ineffectiveness of quote-unquote Marxist-Leninist revolutionary groupings in advanced capitalist societies has to do with their failure to take seriously the context of capitalist, social de- of capitalist democracy in which they operate. These groupings tend to treat capitalist democracy as a complete sham, and therefore to accord a wholly subordinate place to electoral struggles, a form of activity for which they have great contempt. Whereas social democratic parties suffer from parliamentary cretinism, they tend to suffer from something akin to anti-parliamentary cretinism. The fact is that whatever the limitations of capitalist democracy may be, and they are drastic enough, no party or grouping operating within its context can afford not to seek some degree of electoral support, not least at the local level. This requires a great deal more than a sudden eruption on the scene at election time. What, then, has been, and should be, the socialist alternative to these groupings? It has already been argued here that social democratic parties cannot realistically be taken as such an alternative. That alternative entails a firm revolutionary commitment, namely the wholesale transformation of capitalist society in socialist directions. But it also involves a reformist commitment, insofar as it seeks all reforms which can be seen Form you part mean, of the larger revolutionary purpose. <laughs> what? Bleeding. I'm bleeding out of my nose. She stabbed me in the face. What did she stab you with? Her claws. <laughs> Rachel, can you do me a favor? Oh, she's probably downstairs. I gotta Simone. go. Keep talking. I gotta. I know. I'm bleeding Simone, all over my myself. Goodness. I've been viciously attacked by my cat. I'll be right back. <laughs> Simone class trader moments. Um oh my goodness. <laughs> Whew. Um sorry, uh Cal Pal, Kai Pal, I can't tell what that one is Ka- one pal. Um basically this is a talking about going beyond social democracy in a way that isn't Cal, thanks. Um, that isn't kind of the Marxist-Leninist route that also doesn't particularly work, especially within what they refer to as the kind of like 
center of capitalism. Um, yeah. Anyways. Such revolutionary reformism involves intervention in class struggle at all points of conflict in society and preeminently at the site of work. It also involves electoral struggles at all levels and conceives these struggles as an intrinsic part of class struggle without allowing itself to be absorbed into electoralism and parliamentarism. It also means the permanent striving to strengthen the socialist presence on the political scene and in the political co political culture. Jody has your nose. Uh, it's fine. Oh, wait, yeah, I can post the it other was, link. It also. is very uh, weird. Like, uh, it wasn't even a scratch. She like, it was just like a like a, and she like pricked my nose, and then it was like gushing blood. It seems to have like stopped for the most part, but uh, it was weird. She really, she really did not want to look at the camera. I was trying to get her to look at the camera, and she was like, "No." <laughs> it just caught me well. Blood. I think it's stopped now. Now we know. Um. But yes, we are. We are. This is why this. we be polite. <laughs> yeah, I I mentioned it a little bit while you were gone. That was the main thing that I spent time doing. Um. Would we add again? I can pick up. Blah blah blah. Uh, I just finished the paragraph on the top there. So the itch. It should also be said is where we're starting now. It should also be said that revolutionary reformism does not postulate a smooth and uneventful transition to socialism by way of electoral support and parliamentary majority. It acknowledges that in the context of capitalist democracies, such a transition requires a massive degree of popular support and commitment, one of whose expressions, but by no means the only or even the most important one, is electoral strength and parliamentary representation. But revolutionary reformism is also bound to be very conscious of the fact that any serious challenge to dominant class must inevitably evoke resistance, and will be determined to meet that resistance with every weapon that this requires, including, of course, the mobilization of mass support. Very important. Very important. That last part. Mm -hmm. Which is why, like, this is another reason why any of these, like, everyone's like, I voted! like no no you need to join us in the streets and throw rocks at them um do not check obs or whatever to see if you're dropping street frames you i am keep... not dropping frames i can't tell if it's just my phone doing it i think it's your... but it keeps like lagging out a little bit i think it might be your phone because it says i'm fine on obs there's absolutely zero drop frame okay thanks in historical terms, the parties which have embodied this revolutionary reformism. Uh, well, one second. Why are you sad, too? Why the sad? In historical terms, the parties which have embodied this revolutionary reformism are the communist parties of the advanced capitalist countries. And others as well, for that matter. To say this may seem paradoxical, since they have always... Since they themselves have always fiercely rejected the reformist label, not surprisingly given the pejorative connotation it acquired in 1914. But the labeling is nevertheless fully justified. It is, in fact, the revolutionary part which may be the more problematic. The reason for saying it is justified is that after yeah. the first years of Thurmanjang, following the Bolshevik Revolution and the foundation of these parties, it came to be understood that the overthrow of capitalism was not the agenda, was not on the agenda. And communist parties installed themselves as best they could, and insofar as bourgeois, 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 <laughs> and insofar as bourgeois governments allowed them to do so, in the political life of their countries, and became in fact, if not in name, reformist parties with an ultimately revolutionary vocation, a strong engagement in class struggle, taking part in electoral contests and pressing for immediate as well as long-term gains in reform. There were periods when twist in common term policy, for instance, the third period, class against class, social democrats are social fascist phase between 1929 and 1934, or the twist in Soviet foreign policy, the imperialist war phase between 1939 and 1941. Oh, Ooh, what's happening? It's happening to two cars too. Where, like, the delayed. lagging is happening. And yeah, it's been getting worse. Oh, no! Yeah. 
getting worse. I got, I got, I'm not getting any delays on OBS. I mean, it must be on Twitch's end then. I'm just going to close a few happening. of my windows. Let me know if that helps. I don't know if it will help or not, so I'm going to continue. You let me know if it helps or not. I did close out of a few things. Uh... Uh, it sounded like that was a... No, it's still... It's, it's being... still delayed. Well, I don't know how to solve that. But like, it hasn't stopped being delayed for a little bit now on my end. What kind of delayed? Like, buffering? Yeah. Like, continuously buffering. Um, it just shows you reading... That paragraph that you finished a while ago. Weird. I think it's... For me, it still shows you on um, in historical terms of the parties which have embodied the revolutionary reformism are the communist parties. So, two paragraphs above. Weird. I don't know. I don't know why it's. Uh, I don't know what's happened. I I don't even know where to begin to fix it. Other yeah. The, to plow through, like how do like how do I fix that? Delays are delays. All I can do is chastise the internet. Be be better, internet. I'm looking at you, internet. How much longer? Not much longer, I don't think. Yeah, we're like right near the end. Yeah. Okay, okay so well, we'll, we'll just plow through it and early and not really respond to chat. I apologize. Yes. Big, big sorries for that. What was fundamentally wrong? Well, I guess I, I had to do this. But this represented the exception rather than the rule, and that position has not, on the whole, been taken up since 1945. I also didn't know a lot about this because I'm not even sure what the social fascist phase between 1929 and 1934 is. Maybe I will. I, I just. Uh, it was, the next book I plan yeah. to read is the one that you lent me, although this is probably just about the revolution and not, uh, not what they're talking about. I, I am going to read this. I don't know what October. book it is. October. Oh, no, that's a totally... That's it's just the, revolution. the October Revolution. Yeah. But that's not at all... Like, the third period is the time... Like that's 1929 to 1934. You're reading about no, just realized, October 1917. My brain went to revolution, and then I immediately realized that it's probably going to be way before that event. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, anyways. What was fundamentally wrong with these communist parties was two things. First, their total subservience to Stalin's policies and purposes, and secondly, closely related to this, their mode of organization. Enough has been said and written about the Stalinism of communist parties between the late 20s and the early 50s to take this as a given here. For present purposes, it is enough to note the degree to which the combination of sectarianism and opportunism which characterized Stalinism, together with sudden changes of policy imposed from Moscow, blighted their politics and blunted their political effectiveness. Indeed. As for their mode of organization, the democratic centralism to which they subscribed, and which the nature of Stalinism made imperative, how else could total obedience be imposed? Help to foster all the vices which have been discussed earlier, and which turn these parties into profoundly undemocratic institutions in which deviation was impermissible and in which the word of the leadership was law, whatever that word might be, and however much the word of the moment contradicted the word that had gone before, attempts might be made to provide the leaders with a sim simulacrum of democratic legitimation by the holding of party congresses, but these were manipulated in stunted affairs which gave no real power or influence to ordinary members. You're trying to communicate to our audience? through the, the text channel? Yeah, because I feel like the text chat is probably more live than where we are in video. I got, I got my first uh, dropped frame detected. It's just one. Okay. Just one. And it says it was only just dropped one. a few seconds ago. No others. Nope. 
Um, Did the internet explode? They came for Facebook, and now they're coming no, for me. because I can hear you. Oh, yeah, two cars can see Jody's clock compared to his. That makes sense. That's so weird. Um, wait, I just read, I read that out loud, and now he's going to hear it in, like, five minutes. That's all right. Um, yeah, it's six minutes behind. Wow. Dear Lord, how the hell did that happen? Was it Simone? Simone not only pierced my nose, but pierced the space-time continuum? I will read off. <laughs> Unquestioning subservience to the Soviet Union by communist parties has, generally speaking, given way to a more flexible stance. Though parties differ in the degree to which they allow themselves freedom to criticize Soviet policies and actions. On the other hand, democratic centralism endures as a principle of organization and ensures the perpetuation of the stultifying practices of the past. Old habits die hard, particularly when they are so convenient to a leadership, thus rendered irremovable by the party membership. These are crippling weaknesses, and there is also much else in the well, mode. Liz Rowley's been leader. What was that, sorry? Liz Rowley has been leader of the Communist Party of Canada for, like... Oh, yeah, yeah. A good 30, 35 years. Yeah, yeah. These are crippling weaknesses, and there is also much else in the mode of operation, the policies and positions of communist parties which warrant severe criticism. But they are much less vulnerable to the charge which is usually leveled against them by their Marxist-Leninist opponents on the left, namely their reformism. For there is a profound fundamental sense in which revolutionary parties in the context of capitalist democracy do need to engage in a politics which it is which it is very glib to denounce as reformist and therefore as beyond the question. The real question is what kind of reformism parties which affirm a revolutionary vocation actually do engage in. At one end there is the revolutionary reformism which was discussed earlier. At the other there is a reformism constituted constituted by a practice which tends increasingly towards social democracy and is increasingly oblivious to the larger transformative purposes in which reforms are or ought to be inscribed, which comes to be dominated by electoral calculations to the detriment of principle, is more concerned with the control of class struggle than an encouragement, and allows policy to be chopped and changed according to the opportunistic maneuvers of party leaders. The French Communist Party provides a very good example of this kind of reformism, the Italian Communist Party, on the other hand, mirrors well the struggle between the two kinds of reformers. It is so weird, typing from the present, speaking from the past. That is very weird. Great, now they're going to hear that in five minutes. I know, I know. That's all right. If it is the case, as has been argued here, that revolutionary reformism, or whatever else the position encompassed by the formula may be called, does represent an alternative to social democracy and points in realistic fashion beyond it. The very large question which this poses is what agencies are to push this forward. The argument so far developed is clear, clearly intended to, to suggest that social democracy does not offer any reasonable hope of turning itself into such an agency, that communist parties carry burdens from the past which make it very difficult for them to undergo the process of transformation, which is required for the purpose, and that Marxist-Leninists' groupings to the left of communist parties operate in far too narrow an ideological and political framework to make it possible for them to turn themselves from small sects into substantial parties. How this situation will be resolved is not clear, and will in any case be resolved differently in different countries. In some, communist parties may come to shed their negative features and form the basis for a socialist realignment on the left. Not yet in here, anyways. Don't think that happened anywhere. <laughs> in others, that realignment will have to come from other left sources. However, it comes to pass, the process is likely to be protracted. Serious socialist parties cannot suddenly be conjured up out of nothing. Be I think that. that's also a good, yeah, important aspect is the like can't conjure them out of nothing because like that is how a lot of groups kind of like newer orgs or like the communist party as well seem to like think of things where it's like oh we're just gonna like call upon the masses and boom they'll be here and boom we'll have revolution 
or Boom will have popular support, or yeah, whatever, just, whatever, whatever. Because I think a lot of those people get fed up with the fact of like conservative or reactionary people being entrenched in whatever things do currently exist. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Hello, Keffels. Oh, uh, I hope that this Keffels. isn't going to be a time delayed response to you because apparently your stream is delayed for some reason. So I will type in the chat. And I will, but thank you. Whoops. I will acknowledge here as well. Uh, I I do believe we we talked over uh, Twitter messaging, but I think the plan is that Keffels will be on stream with us on Wednesday. Lots of buffering. I don't know what's happening. I, there's nothing I can do about it. My thing is not saying that I'm dropping a ton of frames. It just started doing it recently. Uh, and I don't I don't fully know how to fix that right now. But yes, if all goes according to plan, uh, Keffels uh, will be on stream with us on Wednesday to shoot the shit about politics and then uh, maybe also watch some other, uh, some other stuff. Yeah, maybe, maybe Twitch is being attacked just like Facebook. Uh, Keffels said that their stream is fine earlier. Well, mine was fine earlier too. It's just not fine now. Yeah, fair. I don't know. They'll hear that in yeah. <laughs> 10 minutes or whatever the delay is now. Eight minutes. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'll keep reading, though. And yeah. thank you, Keffels. Thank you for the resubscription. Much appreciated. Be that as it may, the point is that socialist cause, uh, the socialist cause needs political articulation. And that this political articulation, though not exclusively provided by parties, does nevertheless require the agency of a party. However useful and effective other elements of pressure in the political system may be. Trade unions, movements of women, blacks, uh, ecologists, peace activists, and many others. They cannot and do not, for the most part, wish to fulfill the main task of socialist parties, which is to inject a stream of socialist tendency by word and action into the political system and culture of their society. Such parties are, of course, concerned with immediate issues, grievances, and demands, but they are also, beyond this, concerned with the effective dissolution of the structures of power of capitalist society and the replacement by a fundamentally different social order. Definitely. Jeez. Based upon the social ownership and control of the main means of economic activity and governed by principles of cooperation, civic freedom, egalitarianism, and democratic arrangements far superior to the narrowly class-bound arrangements of capitalist democracy. Many parties of the left have advocated these principles over the years for reasons uh, given earlier. They have also suffered from great weaknesses, which reduced or nullified their effectiveness. This sooner, uh, the sooner these weaknesses are faced and overcome, the better will become the prospects of socialist advance. And we are done for us. For our viewers, you will apparently be done in eight minutes because I don't, I don't know what the, yeah. the fuck is happening. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Hello, my rebels. Hello, my rebels. I'm a good boy. I'm a weirdo.